Welcome everyone, this is Tim Pullman and you're listening to the SEP Couch. This podcast is all about standard essential patents. We talk about patent strategies, friend licensing, patent pooling and patent litigation. So let's dive into today's episode. He is a patent attorney and partner with Herity and Herity, but also he is a very famous podcast host on Class 8 Podcast. And I'm super happy to have here now, you know, tables have turned, Eli Mazur with me. Hello, Eli. Hi, Tim. Thank you for having me. We had so much uh, fun talking on my podcast. I'm uh, excited to continue our conversation. Yes, and welcome to the couch, SEP yes. couch. So, um, <laughs> Happy to have you here um, and um, learn more about you, your business. Um, you're not only a podcast um, host, you have other things to do and other hobbies, to put it that way. So I would love to learn more about that. But as I always start, um, you know, this podcast is really focused on SEPs. So um, I, I, I keep asking people, tell me about your career, but in particular, please focus on where did you get first in touch with SEPs and friend and all that. Sounds good. So the Clause 8 podcast is probably my, my only hobby <laughs> with uh, three little kids. But uh, yeah, my day-to-day -day job, I focus on patent preparation, prosecution, including a lot of standard central uh, patents. And the way I got there is I uh, went to undergrad uh, for computer science. Uh, but by that point, I did enough programming to know that I did not want to do that as a career. So I was on the lookout to do something else with that knowledge. And I heard about patent law. Uh, that seemed like a good field. So I went to law school. And while I was in law school, I, I got a job with a big IP firm in the US as a patent agent uh, while still going to law school uh, part-time in the evenings. And uh, most of that job involved patent preparation prosecution related to what my background was, which was software, internet, and business methods. And even before, uh, for your listeners who are familiar with Section 101 and patent eligibility uh, it's been a big issue in the U.S. Um, about what you can get a patent for. But even before that, it was still very hard to obtain patents related to business methods in the U.S. Patent Office. The part of the U.S. Patent Office that, uh, you know, dealt with that, they were kind of, uh, some called it the rejection office because they wouldn't grant any patents. So it was, for me, it was a good training ground to learn how to effectively work with the USPTO to obtain patents, even uh, when I had to work with uh, that part of the office. And, uh, you know, uh, I also got experience with litigation and licensing and that kind of thing. Uh, but since I've been at my current firm, Herity & Herity, uh, most of my focus has been on patent preparation related to, the, to, to that. Um, and, you know, some clients, you know, found out that I was pretty good at obtaining patents from uh, in difficult situations. So they, uh, you know, ended up transferring portfolios to me um, that, you know, or uh, individual patents that they thought were important to try to help me get that. And I didn't really know anything about center central patents about maybe like hearing about it in that. But uh, fortunately, our firm, um, Qualcomm became a client um, and everything that I say has, <laughs> is uh, public and my own opinion has nothing to do with Qualcomm, but um, it's really brought me on this center central patent journey uh, you know, it's allowed me to work, I, I'd say, with the truly the smartest and uh, people that I've ever worked with in my career. Um, and uh, it's given me a new appreciation for innovative comp companies like Qualcomm that come up with this kind of complex foundational technology and the role that patents play in that. Um, so I've been doing a lot of patent prosecution related to, to that since that time. Um, and, you know, I've relied on my own old skill sets of uh trying to obtain patents as effectively as possible, but there's a, a, a lot of new complications that come with standard essential patents that I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, at the same time, I started my Closet podcast, and one of my first guests was David Kapos. Uh, the U he was the US pa uh, USPTO, the director of the US Patent Office under the Obama administration, and he was involved with uh, it, it, that administration issuing that first standard essential patent policy statement. Um, and it seems every guest that I've had since, even when I didn't plan to discuss with them certain essential patents, uh, who worked in high levels of the U.S. government, it has come up because it was a big part of what they dealt with, uh, the companies on both sides. Uh, 
um, are, I guess, <laughs> want to change things. Uh, the implementers have a lot of uh, power and they, in the Obama administration, they worked in the highest levels of the government. And the innovators, it's really, you know, in some ways it's a, uh, what their business is, is, is built on, um, on standard central patents. Um, so it's been a big part of the, a lot of the interviews that I've done, and that's how I ended up interviewing you, uh, come across your podcast, you know, uh, it, it's a, it's a fascinating SCP world out there and, um, I'm learning more about it every day and, uh, enjoying that. It, it sure is. And, um, that also brings me to my next question. I think for the listeners, I mean, our listeners know a lot about SEPs, but I, I like to hear different perspectives and, you know, you as, um, uh, someone who drafts claims, um, and and you know you have to actually understand the technology behind it, which I never was able to. So you know <laughs> how to read a patent, you know how to read a standard, right? Yeah. File a standard essential patent. I think that is needed. So can you elaborate a bit? What makes an essential patent, in your opinion, or from your point of view as a patent attorney, what makes it special? What is different? I mean, it is a patent. We can agree on that. But why is why is an SEP somehow special? Sure. Well, I think what makes it most special that once it is a patent is that you know that the some of the smartest engineers in the world got together and decided that the invention that is covered by that patent is so good it should be included in the standard and when you're talking about you know cellular technologies or 5g you're really talking about you know the most transformational technology out there that all of the other innovations or most of the, a lot of the other big innovations out there are built on it. So over the last 20 years, that's what it is. Um, and when you have a standard central patent, that's what it represents. You know, many other patents out there, uh, they, uh, you know, a bunch of people got into a room and say, well, let's see what we can brainstorm random ideas, you know, so that that company out there, you know, that uh, implementer company can increase their patent count for whatever reason. Uh, whatever goals they have in mind. Um, so, so that's, I think, at, at, at foundation, that's the most, uh, the biggest difference. The other thing is, is that, like I mentioned, you know, if to obtain a, a valuable patent, and if it's not an essential patent, you want it to cover what's going to be out there in the world, right? So you want it to cover implementations that will be out there in the world. Um, for standard central patent, that's not enough. It doesn't, even if every, you know, for example, if every, um, you know, uh, auto manufacturer ended up, ends up using your invention, but it's not part of the, you know, cellular technology standards, uh, you know, uh, it's not gonna be a standard central patent. Um, so that's the difference that it's not only it needs to cover what's gonna be implemented in the future, but it needs to cover what's gonna be in the standard and ideally, it should cover it in the same way, described in the same way that it's covered in the in the standard. So it adds a, an extra level of complexities. You know, when I you said you, you don't really understand them, and I I, I think you're half kidding, but uh, it's uh, I've listened to your podcast enough to know that. But when I started working on it, reading those standard documents, even if you understand the invention, it's like a foreign language, right? Uh, and things are not even described in the way that. You know, these same inventors might have talked about it a long time ago. So there's an extra level of complications that come come with all of that um, uh, with obtaining center central patents. But but I think that is the exciting part, and 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 that's maybe let's let's talk about the process here, right? Because um, I think often the, some some people are misunderstood or is a misperception that they just get an SEP and then they get a lot of money out of it, right? But yeah. this just getting an SEP is, is um, you know, not that, not only that you need a lot of R&D, but how do you hit the target, right? A moving target, right? And um, let's let's talk about this process because um, you as a patent attorney, you typically deal with invention disclosures, right? You, you get like an idea from your client and they want you to draft claims that, where the idea that a new invention, the novel invention is somehow covered by the claims, but now, you know, there's a standard and how do you hit the target, right? How do you make sure that claim you draft hits the standard? And what, can you explain a little bit the, the process here? What do you get from your clients? What extra information then you need? Who is helping you or who gives you input and how much else of information is, are you pulling together to draft yeah. in the very end your essential claim? Yeah. So I think, you know, 
some the perception that someone who created is that you know some companies obtain st- what they cost in essential patents, knowing that they're not essential and they're invalid. But uh, putting that aside, you know, th- the reality. I guess I'm going to kind of tr- try to work backwards, right? So eventually, whatever patent you want to get, you want to cover the final standard that's going to be out there, and whatever patent you want to get, like you said, you want it to be valid. So you want it to be for a new invention uh, that wasn't out there uh, by when you filed your application. The thing that kind of really surprised me, you know, uh, you know, if you prosecute different applications in the patent office, it's, it's, it goes differently. But the thing that surprised me about prosecuting in this area is that how good of a search the, the U.S. patent office examiners do, right? So if you file a patent application and somebody files a patent application slightly earlier than you, you know, a month earlier or maybe two weeks earlier, and you might not even know about it, you might not have access to it if another company does that when you're drafting the patent application, that examiner is going to find it, right? And uh, it's it's kind of like, it's almost like magic, right? <laughs> and it's a bit frustrating because, you know, you know your, your inventor might have come up uh, with that invention first. Uh, and you try to get that application filed as soon as possible, uh, but you know things happen, and sometimes uh, you know somebody kind of beats you to it. So, so I guess what do we do at our front end? So, you know, like you said, they provide us an invention disclosure form, but at that point, like I mentioned, you don't know what you don't. You, obviously, you want to make sure that it overcomes all the prior art that's out there. So maybe you want to do. These engineers know what's going on, right? They're on the top of a level, they're they're really out there. So they know what's going on. Uh, they know what came before it. So they know if it's valid compared to that. Maybe you do some prior art search, you look at that and you kind of, you wanna make sure it's at least valid when it comes to that. And uh, they have an idea about where they think the standard is going, right? They think like this invention is gonna be great for the standard and they really believe in it. And they can't imagine that it's not gonna be included in the standard, right? But our job as patent uh, attorneys is kind of to cover all the eventualities that are out there, right? So when we draft that a patent application, we want to make sure that it covers enough, not only what the inventors think will be in the standard on that day, but what it covers what actually might end up different in the standard, right? So different ways of describing it, enough details and all that. Also, you want to provide more details so somebody doesn't end up, so the examiner doesn't say, well, this is the same thing as somebody else filed two weeks ago. So you want to really build out that invention and make sure that the inventor gets credit for their complete idea and not just a small part of it that they think on that day will uh, you know, end up in the standard. So so that's on that end. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, so you file the application usually before, you know, they submit uh, their idea to the standard body. And that's when, you know, the standard becomes, starts to get finalized. Um, and you want to file, you want to follow that standard and you want to make sure that I guess the claims, which are like the, uh, the legal rights, uh, uh, the define the legal rights in the patent application end up mapping to what's in the standard. Uh, and that's a important part of obtaining a high quality patents and, uh, innovative uh, companies that, uh, you know, th- that devote a lot of resources to doing that. They make sure that that's what happens. You know, that when you look at their portfolio, that the standard essential patents map to what, uh, for their inventions, map to what's in the standard. But is it is it that you let then communicate closely with the inventor back and forth and you both observe their standard and how it develops? Or is it really they hand it over to you and then now it's your job? Like, how is that? Working yeah. On. Yes. So, so good question. I think different companies and outside counsel do it differently. I think the best practice, if you want to obtain high quality patents, is to have a super close communication with the engineers, uh, because you know the technology is so complex. Where I've had experience, like I said, talking to people who are, you know, hundred times smarter than me, but they say, you know, this technology is not exactly what I'm focusing on, you'll need to talk to my colleagues. So it's very specific and you want to make sure that, you know, you know, that the claims that you end up getting align with what's in the standard. 
Uh, so, you know, you know, also what's in the prior art, um, you know, it's, the technology is moving so fast. It's almost impossible for the examiners, USP2 examiners to keep up with it. Like I said, it's very specific and all that. So sometimes you even need to lean on the inventors for, for that to kind of, you know, do a sanity check. You know, this doesn't seem right with the examiner saying, uh, you talked about that, but really what you want to, you, uh, I think a best practice is at least uh, you want to have that open line of communication about what's going on with this standard when you're prosecuting that patent application. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but, but since everything is in flux, everything is moving, are there certain strategies or maybe you walk us through this a little bit because you know you also have a continuous communication with the office right you're not saying this is going to be the claim and then yeah it's going to be the claim right they're gonna also comment and, and do things and and my understanding and maybe you know that's something you can talk about you can also somehow even if you submitted one you can even amend a claim and there's a certain time period until when claims may still change in language what is the typical thing that you that allows you to kind of steer that claim language along with the standard? Sure. So, uh, you know, you, you can imagine in most jurisdictions, uh, the thing that's different is that uh, in the U.S., we have a little more flexibility to amend the claims, which means, you know, change, change the language of the claims. If we have support for that concept or invention in the original application. Uh, for example, in other jurisdictions in Europe, uh, examiners like to see what's called literal support. So they want to use, even if you have that exact invention described in the uh, application, if you're not using, they don't want you to put language that's uh, different from what's in the claim. So going back to what I said, when you draft that application, you want to make sure that you're capturing all the possible combinations, you know, that you can think of at that point. And in the U.S., you know, similar to Europe, and now with respect that, you know, throughout the process, you can amend the claims. So usually with any patent application, you file it, the examiner might find new prior art or a combination of prior art uh, that they see is the same as your invention, and you might need to amend. So usually, you know, you add some, add some features to the claims that add something that's different about your invention from what the examiner found. Um, in, in the, with the standard central patents, you know, you might want to maybe remove features that you thought might end up in the standard, uh, but don't end up in the standard. And uh, like, I, so there's a lot of moving things. You want at the same time you want to map to the standard. You want to overcome the prior art, uh, and you want to make sure you're thinking about all of that at the same time. Uh, you know, claim charts is a really good practice to kind of start that process early on um, during patent prosecution, so you have that. Uh, but because of that, you know, I've become a really huge fan, you know, when I had to deal with the difficult examiners of examiner interviews. In the U.S., unlike some other jurisdictions, you have the opportunity to actually get on the phone with an examiner. Uh, sometimes in the past, you were able to meet in person, but get on the phone with an examiner. And before you make those amendments, before you make those arguments, you can actually talk to them about it. And the great thing is about that is, you know, they'll give you feedback. So... Uh, you don't end up doing something that they don't agree with because if that, if you end up doing something that they don't agree with, it's a waste of a client's money and resources. And you also risk in the US, it's called prosecution history estoppel, which if you do something on the record in written form, uh, when that patent is enforced, all of that can be held against uh, the patent owner. Um, okay. And it, it could be twisted in a way that you, know, you didn't mean at all. Uh, but of course, if it's there and, uh, you know, they need something, uh, they'll find it. Uh, whoever is, I guess, uh, arguing against that patent being enforced. So just to, to make sure I got it right. So if you would add a feature, let's say, to make some claim to be more essential, but then you realize the standard is not adapting the feature as expected, it is somehow a risk to invalidate your patent. So you rather take it out. Is that one of the things? Well, right. So let's say... You Let's say you add a feature. Well, let's say there was a, a it, either a scenario works. So let's say you add a feature which you think will be in the standard, uh, and it ends up not being in the standard. Uh, yeah, you want to take it out so it's essential, right? So for the essentiality piece of it, uh, right. for the validity piece, you want to overcome the prior art. But for the essential piece, yeah, you might want to take out a feature that doesn't end up in the standard, or you might want to, you know, 
use kind of rely on your specification and use the language which will make that mapping to a standard as clear as, uh, as possible while being you know, completely consistent with what was described in your specification uh, because that's a whole other issue. If you describe, if you put something in your claims, it's not in your specification, that's another way to invalidate that pattern. So, you know, you need to think of what's in your application, what's in this standard and what's in the prior art and, and all of that at the same time and kind of get the claims, get the claims to cover that. Yeah. I mean, listening, listening to you, Eli, I, I, I keep hearing it, the art of claim drafting and it really understand now why it is art, because you have to take so many things into consideration <laughs> and complexities yeah. um, to get it right and um, valid and essential. I think that is, that is probably what it, yeah. what it is. Yeah, just to going back to a piece about, um, you know, what we were talking about in the beginning, you know, sometimes an inventor comes up with a really good invention. They were involved in these standard discussions. They know the standard definitely adopted their invention, but the language that they use is slightly different. You know, whatever, when they were putting these documents together for whatever reason. And, you know, it's super frustrating, right? <laughs> it's come on, I came up with this invention, the standard's gonna have it, they all agreed on it. Uh, I should get the credit for it. So, right. you know, you wanna make sure that, you know, you have kind of the tools to be able to do that. But it's it's an extremely complex process that kind of, I, I think the critics of a system, maybe the system don't quite appreciate, you know. No, I get that. Um, in, in terms of, you know, your podcast, but also your, your you know, work um, with clients that are large or one of the largest SEP holders, um, would you say that um, it really also in volume, we we have more essential patents these days because the technology 5G compared to 4G and early generation is just bigger and co more complex and there's more invention and therefore also ultimately more patents because there are some people that keep saying, I mean, you know, we do data of declarations which are not confirmed essential, which are, I think, double the number of 5G patents compared to with 3G, 4G altogether. But of course, you can claim you can basically claim that they're not all essential, but would you still say it's still much more complex, a lot more inventions, more patents to file? Yeah, I mean the technology piece is probably above above me, but yeah, I think that's definitely true. Uh, that there's more patent activity because there's more inventions that are going on. Um, I, I mean, it's interesting. I think you're also seeing implementers trying to file way more. Uh, trying to obtain more, much more standard essential patents. You see Apple and Google uh, doing so very publicly where they are building up 5G teams. Um, and, you know, they're trying to do that. I, I think it remains to be seen if they're successful or not. Uh, but I think the, the number of obviously, slowly the total number of standard essential patents will increase as well. Um, if they're somewhat successful uh, or, or at least the declared ones. Uh, and, you know, I'd be interested to see what the iPolitics data says about how well you know uh the different types of uh uh you know with different types of companies how well their standard social patents uh map to map to the standards so right i mean at least what the data says is that they not only file and declare these patents they also go to the standards meeting right so they also yeah. contribute um to the meetings and the automotives in particular have been increasing uh that in of course they're topics like the Vitra X topics that they, you know, yeah. essentially also implement and more the suppliers than the OEMs maybe. But I think at least I could see why you want to be having a seat at the table and then why maybe you also come up with an invention that could help. Right. Yeah. And I have no opinion on this, but I, I mean, I, you know, about how, they're being successful or not, but I do think that, you know, it's easy to go through the motions, right. It's easy yeah. to, you know, hire a handful of, you know, patent attorneys who have some standard central patent experience, you know, hire some, tell your engineers, you know, this is what we're doing now. Uh, but I think unless you have a culture that really appreciates and prioritizes that kind of innovation, uh, the foundational innovation, and is willing to make that investment uh, to do that, I'm, I guess I'm a little skeptical to see, <laughs> you know, you know what, uh, if they end up making contributions, if they have engineers to actually make the contributions uh, that are valuable for the standard, and then that those are covered properly, you know, 
you know, one of the things that you asked me as well, do you talk to the engineers, right? You know, when I work on these standard central plants, I do. But if you have a company, you know, X, Y, and Z, uh, you know, let's say a supplier of an auto company and, you know, their main job with that engineer is to, you know, make sure they get this, make make this component or whatever it is, or make this box. Uh, you, you know, I, I don't think that company might want, want, will want that engineer to spend all their time with a patent attorney uh, talking about their standard channel patent. So I think it's easy to kind of, you know, build a straw house <laughs> and uh, uh, to say, yeah, yeah, we're, do we're doing the standard central patent thing, we're involved in all that. Uh, but I guess it remains to be seen, seen what comes out of that. Interesting. Um, let's talk about validity a little bit more um, because there are people out there that literally say we want to kill patents, right? And uh, there's a particular business model behind that. I think the most uh, known company for that is Unified Patents. A good side story here, the, the co-founder, Sean Abravani, uh, he pitched that idea to me in 2012. He was in Berlin with his family and said, you know, I, I read something about patent trolls that you have been writing about and you want to meet for coffee. I want to pitch you a business idea. Now that's unified patent. So it's it's quite a history there. That was in 212. I think they founded it to 11 or something. But anyways, the anti-troll, they call themselves, and they're killing patents. Lots of SEPs these days. Um, you know, is that is that um, for you as a patent attorney, um, you know, how, you know, is that... In, in the system, you know, why is that? You know, is it, uh, are these really low quality? Is it a somehow loophole in the use PDO system? Can you elaborate on PTAB and filing an IPR? You know, how does that all, how, how does all that work? Sure, yeah, actually, uh, I, I moderated a panel with Sean Avani where he said, uh, it would be better not to have patents at all. So, uh, <laughs> okay, I, it's I, so I, bad I, these <laughs> days. <laughs> so I see, I see his thinking has uh, has evolved. And I actually interviewed the founder of uh, Unified Patents on my podcast, Kevin Jackal, cool. just to try to better understand what they actually do. Which to me, and I've been really curious from kind of, and I'm just curious about these things, to try to understand that I don't really truly understand what their business model is. From what I see, uh, from what I understand, I guess I, I think it's important to. That is that, you know, they challenge, like you said, you know, the, their business, the business came around when um, the U.S., the, the United States, they passed a law called the American Invents Act, and it passed these new proceedings uh, where you can challenge an issued patent at the patent office. And um, the idea was to make it easier and cheaper to challenge a, a patent that should have never been issued in the first place. And um, it, when they passed the law, they uh, created the possibility that third parties can do that. So even though you're not getting sued uh, directly, uh, you can go ahead and uh, uh, challenge those patents. And that was what Unified Patent uh, does. And they have member companies that support them, uh, but they say what they do, they do independently. They don't coordinate. But from what I see, uh, the patents that they mostly challenge uh, or you know most significantly challenge are patents uh, of I guess what they call uh, patent trolls or non-practicing entities that are being enforced against their members. So that's, I think the, in terms of their activity, in terms of challenging patents, that's what they, uh, the primary benefit that they provide their members. The SCP piece, I don't know, I, I asked you that question on my podcast. I really don't actually understand what they're doing on that front, uh, except that I think their members want it. <laughs> their members uh, want this out there that, standard essential patents are, uh, you know, are out there are not, not essential and they're invalid and we're going to help you prove that. So I think it's more of a PR thing from what I, from what I can tell. Uh, if you go on their website, uh, before they had it, uh, you know, they had the, you know, the NPE piece about the non-practicing entity first listed first. Now, if you go on their website, it's all about standard essential patent uh, piece listed first. If you see there are some blog posts, you know, their marketing people are, <laughs> uh, you know, they're they're eager to communicate that they're focused on that. So I think that's what it is. I mean, in terms of, you know, what we do, you know, I think uh, the problem that's going on in the U.S. with the post-grant proceedings is that you can challenge the same patent over and over and over again, right? And you can challenge the same uh, patent using all kinds of different art. You can challenge it even after a court decides that the patent is valid. 
And the problem with that is obviously is that um, it makes it much harder to enforce patents, right? Um, and uh, it's kind of, uh, it, if you're an independent inventor, it makes it almost impossible because even if the post grant proceedings, even if they get wrong 10% of the time, if you challenge that patent statistically, you know, I, I know that, uh, I know you're an economist, so you're correct me, but if you challenge enough patents, uh, you know, 10 times, uh, then, you know, they'll eventually invalid invalidate them. And, um, you know, for if, if you're a sophisticated uh, innovator, which files, you know, thousands of patents, you know, you'll probably build a portfolio that's going to be very hard to do that. And, you know, unified patents is not going to waste their money uh, to kind of go after that. Like you said, I think on my, on my podcast, uh, but, you know, I think they're going to create they're going to create this aura. Uh, it helps create this aura that SCP patents are bad. So that's, and, that's and, what it's about to. And, and there's, I, I read only about it, but maybe you have more details. There is this um, proposal for a patent reform out there in the US, which may make it, you know, harder to, to, to file these IPRs. Can you, can you talk about that or you have any info on this? Sure. sure yeah. Actually, one last piece I'll add about, I guess, because I, you asked uh, what, you know, how does it impact what we do? I guess the oh yeah. The PPD. So so you know in terms of strategies, you know, back I guess around the time when I started practicing, the idea was you want to get a claim as broad as possible, right? But the thing is, because it's so easy to challenge invalid claims at the PTAB or even valid claims that seem way too broad, um, it's actually these days there might be an advantage to obtaining very narrow claims as long as they map to the standard right if you know that very narrow claim maps to the standard is going to be very much harder to challenge it on invalidity ground so that's one strategy there are other strategies like you know using means for claims which is kind of getting a little into the weeds but you want to be thinking about it because you want to just make your portfolio very difficult to challenge at the PTAB so we kind of give up and move on to somebody else I guess um you know your question about the, the yes yeah, so of the the new direct director of the USPTO, she proposed uh, a, a bunch of rules, or it has, a, I think it's a, a like a preliminary ideas about rules. It has a big, big a, a acronym like NPRM or something like that. And one of those rules is, I guess, would, uh, or they're asking for comments about the idea whether third parties should be able to challenge uh, patents. You know, I think these sets of rules uh, I think these sets of rules are unlikely. It's unlikely that anything will happen with them because, uh, you know, just just realistic about how democratic governments thankfully work. It's difficult to get things done, uh, even even within an executive branch. So I don't think these sets of rules will happen. Uh, but I think there's legislation that's being talked about uh, along the same ways. And you know, I I don't know. I, I I'm curious. I, I haven't heard a compelling reason myself about why third parties, how it helps patent system or innovation, the third parties are able to uh, challenge uh, patents in this way. I think it, what it does is, as you, you and I discussed, is it increases transaction costs, right? So that the resources that, uh, you know, a small innovator might need to, uh, might need to devote to enforcing their patent portfolio, uh, they're going to need to devote more resources to doing that, and they're going to be able to spend less resources on the innovation, right? And I haven't heard a good reason why not only you have to go through litigation with a very deep-pocketed, uh, you know, implementer who's going to, you know, start litigations in every country around the world, in every jurisdiction in the world, but also at the same time, you have to kind of uh, deal with these third parties. I, I mean, I, I don't quite understand that. Um, maybe there is some kind of service that they provide. Uh, you know, I know some nonprofits, I guess, maybe theoretically would do that, you know, uh, but but I, I guess I haven't heard of compelling uh, stories to show that. Interesting. So to summarize, you don't think much will change, even though, you know, it's still kind of um, difficult to understand the current system and why it is in place in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 think, uh, I think unified pants is safe. For a while <laughs> and i'm sure they'll come up with a new model 
if, if there are any changes. They are. I, I admire them for what they built. So. <laughs> I, I'm sure they will. Um, maybe let's let's go to another proposal out there here in Europe. Um, and I I don't want to go into much detail about you know the economic effects or where licensing will happen in the future. But um, one part I'm I'm curious uh, to hear your opinion about is that the European Commission, as many know, have proposed a regulation um, to set up a register, basically. Every patent owner um, that owns also SEPs should um, register or submit and declare the essential patents only uh, to a certain database um, and make sure they're really essential. Uh, can you tell me, or what's your opinion about that? Um, um, I mean, the argument is often that every SEP holder probably has their patents claim credit anyway, so there should be not too much cost about it. But then I keep hearing that may not always be true because, you know, um, especially with large portfolios, that is not always the case. And then only once they're granted and even after grant, there can be challenges to that as we learned and changes. So what what is your thought about such a register? Um, do you think that makes sense? Is it is it costly? Is it is it, you know, you need to maintain it, I guess. Um, any opinions? Yeah, I guess this is my, this is my own, completely my own personal opinion. I guess my gut is saying, I guess is make, leading me to like, well, why do they really want it? And uh, you know, those who are pushing for it. And and uh, I think uh, they want it so they can have access to that data so they can, you know, uh, twist twist the data to kind of further their PR aims, right? You know, so like I said, you know, whatever the claim charges out there, they have at least, if, if the idea is really to provide claim charts, if they're going to be public or whatever, they're going to have access to them, they're going to twist them and kind of uh, try to present some story uh, you know, oh, here's 10 claim charts that are bad out of, you know, 10,000 or whatever. Um, the other piece, of, as I understand the proposal, uh, you know, I'm outside here, but I've, I've been very interested in it, about it and talking to people about it is, you know, they actually want to set up uh, some kind of commission with experts who are going to review the patents for essentiality. And I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm like, who came up with this? Uh, I guess that's my that's my guy reaction. Uh, actually, I know I think you had somebody from Japan uh, interviewed on your podcast, and they said something like that was tried in Japan and didn't work at all. Uh, who did they? Who did this commission? You know, the European Commission come up with that with this idea? I guess uh, I think you had another guest talk about how you know there's been studies that um, experts within the same company evaluated the same patents for essentiality. And they still had a different of opinions. Yeah. This stuff is super complex. Like I said, uh, you know, you have to be uh, the parties. You have to be at the forefront of this innovation to really be able to make those kind of uh, judgment calls about essentiality, uh, about saying, you know, if, if you're the innovator and you're the implementer who's implementing that standard, you're looking at that standard and you know, oh, yeah. This innovator came up with this patent, and come on, it maps to that, uh, to it maps to that uh, standard. And in the licensing negotiation between those two parties, they can have those kind of sophisticated, complex discussions. The idea that there's going to be some kind of uh, government bureaucrats in Europe who are just going to be able to do this well from day one or ever. I think, I, I just don't buy that. Uh, going back to what I said about US examiners, and I'm super impressed about how well and thoroughly they examine these 5G applications, but it's difficult for them for the reasons that I said. The technology keeps changing. So if they look at something and it seems the same to them, it, it's not the same. And anybody who's actually at the forefront of a technology might know that. Um, and uh, so, so I, I just don't think that will work. Uh, you know, so what, once I said, I, th I think the purpose of that is just to make it, uh, if, if I have to decide, is just to make life more difficult for um, for innovators who want to license their uh, standard central plan portfolios. So I, I think that's great. I, I think that's my impression. Yeah, great. No, lots of great insights. I think also on the technical complexity part of it, and and you know how difficult it is. I also remember one 
um, person from from Ericsson once told me to really um, make a case about essentiality, you don't only need the inventor and the legal person, you also need a product person because you need to know where and how it was implemented even. So, yeah. uh, and, and three people working over a week on one patent only, we can see if that is, <laughs> that's, is that's the level of complexity, then, um, you know, welcome to look through the 60,000 patent families for 5G only, right? That's the number. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, I mean, of course, they only look at European patent, but again, that rather be a limitation, I guess, to the database anyways. But great, Eli, lots of great insights on, you know, the world of patent drafting in complex situations of standard essential patents. I um, would say another good perspective on why it is um, so complex and what is so special about SEPs compared to other patents. I always... Um, uh, give the last um, pitch to my interviewed people on my SEP couch here to kind of summarize what you want our audience to be remembered. Sure. So I guess the one piece of advice, you know, I'll, I'll go back to my day job of obtaining standard essential patents is, you know, if you're in-house counsel or outside counsel, you want to make sure that you don't get stuck in zombie mode in that, you know, We've been obtaining patents in the same way for a long time, and we're going to keep doing that. Uh, and it, because if you do that, likely the patents that if you're obtaining patents today, the same way you did 20 years ago, uh, you're probably paying way too much and you're obtaining patents that aren't valuable. Uh, so you constantly want to be thinking about what is the best way to build the patent portfolio with valuable patents in a cost-effective manner that's in line with where the technology is going where the patent law is going, uh, and you know all those other issues that we talked about today. Great, thank you so much. That was Eli Mazur on the art of claim drafting and SEPs. Um, if you ever wanna have an essential and, and, and valid portfolio, uh, he's a go-to law firm, but also if you wanna learn about more SEPs and you're interested in more podcasts that also touch on SEP topics, my favorite podcast in the IP world, is clause eight so listen to that great episodes um thank you so much for being here eli and um i hope to see you soon uh thank you so much tim it's been a lot of fun to talk with you again 